Good afternoon. Good afternoon from Athens. I'm Thanasis Platias, Professor of International Relations and Strategy at the University of Piraeus. And I would like to welcome all of you to our webinar on the Thucydides Trap, Grand Strategy and Power Transition. Oh, this event is organized by three organizations, the Department of International European Studies at the University of Piraeus, which happens to be uh, the chairman of the department, the Department of International European Studies of the University of Macedonia, and we have together professor with us today, Professor Kuskuvelis, uh, which is currently experiencing some problem with his camera. Uh, uh, professor Kuskuveli, who is professor there and also the chairman of the department, uh, and the Council for Foreign Relations, which is a, a newly established Greek think tank consisting from uh, for 60 uh, university professors in the field of international relations. Oh, so that's the organizers and our topic today is uh, the Thucydides trap. We are delighted to have with us uh, three experts, three world leading experts on Thucydides. Uh, first of all, Professor Adriu Novo. Professor Novo uh, is teaching at the National Defense University in Washington and also at the prestigious school of the George Washington University, the School of uh, Foreign, uh, Foreign Service. Uh, he got his BA in history uh, from Princeton University and his master's and uh, PhD from the University of, of Oxford. He's historian, but uh, uh, he's also an expert in military history, in international security and strategy and international politics. And another expertise is he's uh, probably one of the foremost American experts on Eastern Med Mediterranean. Uh, he has written uh, last year a book on Thucydides uh, with uh, Jay Parker. Uh, the title of the book is Restoring Thucydides, Testing Familiar Lessons and Deriving New Ones. So I have asked him in uh, his presentation uh, to, uh, to summarize his book. Oh, then, uh, what is really interesting about Professor Novo is that this year uh, published a book which I have not yet read, but the title uh, is really exciting, uh, The Oka Caused Nationalism and the Failure of the Cypriot Enosis. Uh, I hope uh, this book will do as well as the Thucydides book, and uh, it shows that uh, Professor Adriu Novo uh, is not only an expert in history and Thucydides, but also an expert uh, in, a, in, our, in our area. Uh, our second speaker today uh, will be Professor Kuskuvelis, uh, Professor of International Relations in uh, the University of Macedonia, and as I said, Chairman of the Department of International and European Studies. He got uh, a law degree from the University of Thessaloniki. Uh, he, he got his uh, master's degree from the University of Denver, Colorado, and his PhD from uh, Grenoble University in France. Uh, he's teaching international relations theory, strategy, negotiations and crisis management, European integration, and he's also an expert uh, in our region. On top of it, he holds the uh, a Greek, a Hellenic Greek of staff chair on Thucydides uh, in the University uh, of Macedonia. Uh, a couple of years ago, he published uh, an extremely interesting book on Thucydides, uh, titled Thucydides on Choice and Decision Making, Why War is Not Inevitable. I mean, the title of the book alone, it clearly links him uh, to, to our topic, which is to see the trap and the ine inevitability of war. And one of the issues that we will examine today is whether uh, US and China are destined for war. And our third scholar uh, that will participate in the discussion uh, is Vasilis Trigas. Vasilis uh, is a teaching, a postdoc teaching fellow 
uh, at the prestigious Schwarzman College at Tsinghua University. Uh, Vasilis uh, got his BA from the Economic University of Athens and his PhD from uh, the prestigious Department of Tsinghua uh, of International Politics at Tsinghua University. Uh, he has been visiting fellow uh, at Columbia University and uh, he used to be Onassis Fellow at the Belt and Road Institute at Tsinghua University again. Uh, he has written extensively uh, in uh, top journals, including the Journal of Contemporary China, the Chinese Journal of International Politics, um, the Global Policy Journal, the Columbia uh, Journal of International Affairs, and many, many other journals. Uh, and uh, recently he co-authored an article with me uh, unraveling the Thucydides trap that has been published by the Chinese Journal of uh, International Politics. So he will base at least his, international, his introductory remarks in, uh, uh, based on this article. Now, we invited two Chinese scholars, Professor Chen and Professor Li, which are really the foremost experts on Thucydides in China. We were unlucky uh, that Professor Chen had an emergency medical problem in his family. So he has to be in a hospital today and not uh, with us. We wish uh, to his family uh, all the best. Uh, with regard to, to Professor Li, uh, which is part of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, uh, which is a, a government think tank, uh, although she enthusiastically accepted our invitation, uh, her bosses uh, revoked the permission to talk, so he will not be uh, with us today. Probably the Chinese um, leaders of the Chinese Academy of Social Science uh, saw the trap, to see the trap, and they thought that uh, this will be a, a, the trap for the Chinese scholar. Anyhow, it's, it's not a trap for the scholar. It may be a trap for China, as Alison said, uh, being trapped in a competitive relation with the United States. But this is precisely what we are going to, uh, to examine today. The inspiration uh, for, for this talk comes from a recent book from, from Professor Allison, a former teacher of mine at Harvard University, uh, that wrote uh, a, a kind of provocative book destined for war, uh, that really brought in the attention the Thucydides trap. Uh, it's not the first time that Thucydides becomes very relevant and very topical and uh, uh, the center of, of, of discussion. As a matter of fact, himself knew that this will happen when he said that his work will be Ktima Isai, will live forever. And he said that in the opening, uh, pay, uh, in the opening paragraphs of his uh, history of the Peloponnesian War. So in fact, his work uh, lives with us today. It's still relevant. And not only today, because of the Allison book on the Thucydides trap, but if you look uh, back in the history, you will see a different period. Uh, Thucydides was central in the discussion. Let's say in the 17th century, uh, the Athenian Empire uh, and the way that Thucydides presented it became a model for the British Empire. In the 19th century, the Germans got the idea that if you have a strong fleet, you can dominate the world. So it was part of the instigation of the British uh, uh, German naval race that did not turn out well, namely we had World War I. Uh, in, during the Cold War, Athens and uh, uh, Sparta uh, were discussed extensively uh, as a model to understand the Cold War either as a bipolar system or as competing ideology between a democratic country and uh, uh, an authoritarian country. Uh, but really the height of Thucydides, at least in international relations and strategic studies, came with the Vietnam War. Uh, I mean, the failure of the United States in Vietnam um, uh, created a soul searching. And uh, the answer to what happened there was found in the failed Athenian expedition in Sicily. So uh, 
of her extension and uh, the Sicilian expedition was linked and was parallel to the Vietnam War and that brought the attention of Thucydides uh, at uh, major world colleges, but also uh, in major international departments. And the recent comeback of Thucydides came with this Allison book, which we will discuss right now, that uh, essentially make an argument that when you have a power transition and the aspiring country tries to overcome the existing hegemon, uh, this usually results in a war. And the title of this uh, uh, book, Destined for World, that's precisely what he photographed. So we'll really try to, to understand uh, by our three commentators today, uh, whether the US and uh, China uh, are destined for war and uh, what's the lesson that we can draw from the city this war. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Platias. Can everybody hear me? Am I, is my uh, communications and sound okay? Absolutely. Excellent, thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to begin with a heartfelt thanks to the Council for International Relations Greece and of course our, our hosts, uh, Professor Platias, the University of Piraeus uh, and the University of Macedonia for the invitation to be with all of you today. It's a pleasure to see uh, some familiar faces and some new ones as well. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us uh, in what I fully expect to be a thought provoking uh, and enjoyable discussion. Uh, before proceeding, I should say that I'm speaking in an entirely personal capacity. My comments just reflect my own views. They're not the views of the National Defense University, the Department of Defense, or the United States government. Now, usually when speaking about Thucydides, this disclaimer is superfluous, right? But today we'll be discussing issues of contemporary security, so I wanted to make sure to, uh, to include it. I'll start with a brief description of Restoring Thucydides, uh, written with my colleague Jay Parker, uh, explain a little bit about why we wrote the book, what we wanted it to accomplish, and then thread those themes through several of the book's core arguments uh, and trying to relate that material to today's subject, which is Thucydides' trap, grand strategy, and power transition. So Thucydides' enduring relevance was reason enough for the project, but it was reinforced by the manner in which Thucydides continues in the famous formulation of Laurie Bagby to be both used and abused. The significance of his work yokes readers who want to use Thucydides to two potential pitfalls, at least. The first is that scholars and commentators often appeal to Thucydides as a final authority. His work, or perhaps a dominant interpretation of his work, can easily become a facile ultima ratio for intellectual debate, right? If Thucydides said it, it must be right. Or if I can appeal to Thucydides as my support, then I must be right. Uh, in our book, uh, Jay and I explicitly write that we're not presenting a sort of final word on Thucydides, but we are hoping to sort of enliven debate to encourage readers to reconsider their preconceptions and most of all, to engage with the text as a whole and to engage with the text itself. As a result, we think that readers should be mindful about taking a single line out of context without exploring the rest of the book. Thucydides, like many great books, is often read only in its most famous excerpts. And these tendencies contribute to what another uh, scholar of Thucydides, Neville Morley, has called the Thucydides paradox, appealing to a complex authority as the foundation for a simplified message. In addition, uh, we may take a line spoken in the history by a third party and conflate their viewpoint with the views of Thucydides. For example, during the famous Melian Dialogue in book five, Thucydides attributes to the emissaries of Athens the claim that the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Those emissaries speak for Athens, but do they speak for Thucydides? Is Thucydides arguing in favor of a political approach based on power, or does he use this episode as a warning against the blind use of, of power? This is a debate worth having. So in the book, we explore several key lessons, looking at them through three lenses, textual fidelity, textual context and historical context. First, we ask whether Thucydides wrote what is ascribed to him. I should add, uh, we don't deal with complete misquotes. So one common example, which I often find in signature blocks, some of which come straight out of the Pentagon, is 
The society that separates its scholars from its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. Thucydides didn't write that, or if he did, it's in a lost section of his manuscript that no one's ever unearthed. Um, instead, we deal with examples that we believe show a twisting of Thucydides' meaning. Perhaps his most famous sentence uh, is subject to this phenomenon. Describing the outbreak of war in book one, according to the famous Rex Warner translation from 1972, what made war inevitable was the growth of Athenian power and the fear this caused in Sparta. This sentence forms the basis of hegemonic transition theory in many ways, arguments about fundamental instabilities within a bipolar international system, and most recently, the rebottling of these concepts into Thucydides' trap. But this interpretation has its shortcomings. First, there's the simple question of translation. As our colleague and fellow panelist, uh, Dr. Kuskovelis has persuasively argued, Thucydides' entire work strives against a concept of inevitability. Inevitability is incompatible with how Thucydides approaches human affairs. It negates human choice and human agency. Instead, debate, argument, and changing opinion all feature prominently in Thucydides' history. Moreover, a more correct translation of the word Ananga said describes the Spartans as perhaps compelled to go to war or feeling that the war was necessary. There are problems with interpreting bipolarity as well. Here I know Professor Plakias disagrees with me, but in the, in the book, we argue that Sparta and Athens did not constitute a, a true bipolar system. Thucydides presents an argument in which Athens and Sparta led two coalitions, which is a first step away from simple bipolarity. And his account reinforces the dependence of Athens on its empire and of Sparta on its allies. Furthermore, a characterization of systemic bipolarity ignores the existence of the Persian empire and its vast resources. In our book, we also explore the nature of power in the context presented by Thucydides and beyond his account. For example, students of Athens and Sparta are well aware of the vulnerabilities of these states. Athens was dependent on imported grain to feed its population. Its empire was fundamentally coercive and subject to revolt. Athens needed to maintain this empire in order to maintain its revenues. It needed those imperial revenues to maintain its fleet, and it needed its fleet to protect its food supply. The commander of the Athenian Navy was, to, far, to borrow Churchill's formulation about the admiral and commander of the Royal Navy, the only man who could lose the war in an afternoon. We also know about the fragility of Sparta's domestic order, particularly the unrest among helots, who Aristotle tells us were perpetually lying in wait for some disaster to befall their Spartan masters. Xenophon more colorfully asserts that every social class below the Spartan peers hated them so much that they would gladly have eaten them raw. Because of its precarious position, Sparta needed allies on land and at sea to retain the ability to project its power. Perhaps because of these vulnerabilities, Thucydides' account also presents something of a contradiction because in the canonical interpretation of power transition, Athens is the rising challenger and Sparta the established hegemon. Remember, the rise of Athenian power causes war with Sparta. But Thucydides presents evidence that inverts this paradigm. Athens at the outbreak of the war, he writes, had the greater part of Hellas under its control. He describes Athens as the dominant economic power of the Greek system, the wealthiest and most populous polis. It had the largest navy and its formidable army was second only to Sparta. We know that Athens was a capital for trade and also a provider of currency for exchange among different city-states. For a Thucydides trap to work, the roles of hegemon and challenger must clearly be defined. In Thucydides' account, such neat designations don't fit and he doesn't really try to make them fit either. Instead, he forces us to confront the many facets of power, how different forms of power interact, and how strengths can be turned to vulnerabilities. It was precisely the dual nature of power and vulnerability that plays so prominently in the account of the outbreak of the war. Having Corinth as an ally increased Sparta's power, but it also made Sparta vulnerable to entering a wider conflict because of Corinthian concerns and initiatives. The quarrel in Corsaira was not a Spartan concern at first. It became a Corinthian concern. Corinthian involvement led to Athenian involvement, and this escalated tensions between Athens and Sparta to the point of war. Sparta's strengths and vulnerabilities indicate that its political leaders were less concerned with 
what we might call the traditional sense of rising power, Athenian territorial gains, military metrics, men and ships, then they were concerned about the defection of their own allies. And here it's worthwhile to pause to think what this interpretation of rising power means for grand strategy or for power transition today. Spartan policymakers felt compelled to back their allies in a dispute with Athens for fear of seeing the Peloponnesian League crumble, not because they were afraid of Athens building more ships. Such a diplomatic tsunami with Spartan allies defecting was possible because Thucydides' account, rather than painting a picture of rigid and immutable alliances, shows the fluidity of politics. Realignment and the threat of realignment could cause significant impacts. Interpretations on the outbreak of war, of course, are critical to how we think about grand strategy and power transition. In the United States, we're fond of quoting the line that, quote, armies prepare to fight the previous war. Now, that proverb, in some form or other, has proved durable, and at least it's not erroneously attributed to Thucydides. But almost without fail, this expression means that tactics, equipment, and doctrine are designed with the previous conflict in mind. Thus, for example, the Maginot Line was designed to defend against a rerun of the Schlieffen Plan, and it was outflanked in 1940 and France was defeated. But the greater value of this expression is a focus on questions of grand strategy. For example, political and military leaders are prepared for the familiar alignments and alliances of yesterday and of today. Often they fail to understand the flexibility of those alignments and how changes in those structures can spark conflicts that they do not seek and are not fully prepared for. When my students use the example of the Maginot Line as a failure of grand strategy, I think they paint an incomplete picture because it was the Soviet Union's sudden alliance with Nazi Germany in the summer of 1939 that left France vulnerable more than any dependence on antiquated tactics. The biggest strategic difference between 1914 and 1939 was not Panzers or Stukas or the Maginot Line, but the reality that Germany fought a two-front war against France and Russia in 1914 and a one-front war against France in 1940. It's unlikely that Athenian leaders fully considered that strife in the peripheral polis of Epidamnus would become a broader conflict between Corsaira and Corinth, which in turn would lead to a dramatic realignment with Athens allying with Corsaira. But this in turn led to a clash between Corinth and Athens and in due course, a Spartan declaration of war against Athens because Sparta felt compelled to back its Corinthian ally. And if Athenian analysts had miraculously seen that far, it would have been nearly impossible for them to imagine that they would have been defeated because of Persian intervention on the side of Sparta and its allies, another sort of dramatic change in alignments. So leaders do prepare for the last war, but this focus is equally misplaced at the strategic level as it is at the tactical level. Leaders should consider that the next war may not be fought with the same alignments of yesterday or today, and that perhaps those very changes in alignment will serve as the spark for conflict or determine its outcome. These were some of the issues that Thucydides also understood and are present in his work. I'll leave things here for now and look forward to your questions and our continuing discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Novo. I think your introductory remark will make all our uh, participants in this webinar to go and find your book on restoring Thucydides because uh, you really uh, approach it through three, four different angles that it's not only a superb introduction, but also places the context for uh, analyzing current affairs. So it's very relevant with regard to, uh, to, to its lesson. We have some minor historical disagreements on uh, the way that you structure the argument, but I, I completely accept your broader argument, and especially uh, how uh, different periods and different persons use Thucydides to validate their arguments, regardless of what Thucydides uh, ha has said. And it's so clear uh, that many scholars, probably including Allison, did not read carefully Thucydides, but they took some kind of uh, well, um, uh, known paragraphs or uh, 
couple of one-liners uh, to, to build their argument. And uh, I will agree with you, in, in the American international relations community, there is a complete confusion when they refer to Thucydides and you use very cleverly the example of the Emilian dialogue. As you said correctly, it was the Athenian ambassadors that they say, that they make that proposition, that the strong will do what they can and the weak, they will suffer what they must. Now, 99% of the American academics uh, attribute this phrase to Thucydides himself. But Thucydides himself talk in the editorial part. Yeah, if you look at the dialogues, you can have two competing views. Uh, one talks about black, the other talks, it's white. So you cannot attribute to Thucydides the same time and the black and the white. Thucydides talks in the editorial section in his own language. The other is what he's reporting. This is a frequent lesson, or uh, this is a frequent problem, uh, and um, a lot of scholars uh, attribute that phrase you are discussing as the foundation of realism, and they attribute it to Thucydides when it's, it's not said by Thucydides. Uh, I just bring that uh, point for, uh, in our discussion. Let me now turn to another interesting book written by Professor Kuskuvelis. And uh, I will ask Elias to really try to reconstruct the Thucydides, to deconstruct uh, the Thucydides trap. I mean, to explain to us why there is no such a thing as Thucydides trap. Elias. Thank you, Thanasi. Thank you for taking the initiative for this uh, meeting. And uh, thank, I, I would like to thank also the other participants. Uh, it was an, op an opportunity to meet again with uh, uh, Andrew Novo, whom I happened to meet here in Greece. And then uh, he, was, he kindly accepted to, uh, to participate, to come to Thessaloniki and participate uh, at the University of Macedonia and give a presentation there, uh, which we have uh, all enjoyed. And uh, then I uh, meet uh, Vasilis Dr. Trigas here, and um, uh, I'm happy um, I come to meet him. And since you two uh, wrote this piece uh, on Thucydides. Now, having said, in, having said that, I must add also that you, uh, Thanasi, uh, Professor Platias, have written a book on Thucydides. So uh, among the, f it makes three of us here and, and your book has been written much earlier than mine and that of, uh, of Andrew. So uh, uh, I guess right now that we uh, met uh, four different people having studied and loving the work of Thucydides we can come out with uh, with an interesting interesting topic. I must apologize for not having uh, for having just a sound because the connection is not is not so good. There are some problems, so uh, I will stick to my time. And please, I apologize again to the to those uh, participating and following the discussion. But I consider it necessary to participate even with with sound and uh, skip, uh, unfortunately, uh, the image. Now, as you, as you said, my, uh, my book is on Thucydides decision-making and choice and choice. I believe that people have the choice in their lives, but, as, uh, but in international politics as well. The question is whether they understand the condition and whether uh, they have the opportunity or the possibility uh, or the possibility to, to choose. And I, I, since you spoke about the Melian dialogue in the fifth book, uh, uh, Thanasi and Andrew spoke, uh, Thucydides again uh, speaks not of, of uh, speaks of equal necessity. It was not, 
it was not obliged when the the, the relevant um, uh, issue here is equal necessity, not equal power. He's not speaking of equal power. He's speaking of equal necessity among the contenders. And that's that's a beginning to, that's an, introduc an introduction to, to my main argument uh, in, on the issue of the Thucydides trap, that Thucydides never spoke of a trap, never spoke of inevitability. Uh, he spoke of, of necessity, right? So necessity uh, is a concept which is essential and central to Thucydides writing and thinking. But uh, let me uh, take things from the beginning. In, in my book, I argue that Thucydides has a theory on decision-making. Uh, basic elements are uh, necessity or human, uh, human agency, uh, human nature, plus, uh, 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 fear, interest, and honor. Those three factors. It is necessity plus fear, interest, and honor, or human nature plus interest, fear, and honor. So this is his basic, his basic theme. And if one looks into his entire uh, work, uh, may, he may find, she may find this theme uh, coming again, repeating itself again and again and again. So in no way uh, we can connect uh, Thucydides to the inevitability of decision-making or of choice. He's rather pro-free choice, to put it that way. Pro-free choice. Now, why I'm 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 saying that uh, the Thucydides trap is uh, is wrong, or as I wrote in one article a few couple years ago, is a distorted compass. Now, a compass is a tool that distorted compass distorts, does not help us, leads us to different ways uh, and different understandings. So this is happening with the so-called uh, Thucydides trap. And I cannot resist uh, remembering um, another another scholar, um, uh, Ned Lebo, who uh, used who 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 replaced uh, the T with a C, uh, and uh, he uh, gave a different negative connotation to Thucydides' trap. Okay. I'm not repeating for, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Okay, but let me say two two are the basic two are the basic problems in uh, uh, this model this construction that that Alison made. The first is that he considers Athens to be the rising power. Now I'm sorry, but uh, Athens already since uh, 478 uh, is, is the leading power. And in the middle of the fifth century, century, Athens has become the superpower, the leading power. So uh, having, uh, presenting in, in his scheme, in Alice's scheme, uh, Athens has been the contender. Uh, I think he, this is historically wrong. Of course, Sparta is there. Sparta has its alliance, but Sparta has abandoned its ambition to lead the, the, the Greeks. Uh, this is a task 
This is an endeavor undertaken by the Athenians and the Athenians uh, took over and led to uh, led Athens to the empire. The empire is Athens. The empire is not Sparta. And since you, Professor uh, Platias, has spoken often of high strategy, uh, we can see in Thucydides and in Athens, not one, but four stages or four different types of high strategy. The developing one under Themistocles, a political personality and a strategist that you honor a lot here in, at the University of Piraeus, should not forget our brother university or sister university, University of Piraeus. Now, Themistocles is the first one to put the foundations of a grand strategy. Then it is Cimon. Uh, Cimon, Simon. Simon is consolidating the, the, the grand strategy and the, uh, the, the Athenian uh, primacy. Uh, the third is uh, Pericles. Of course, Pericles' grand strategy is one of splendor. It's not just a grand strategy in the military, not just a grand strategy in the economics area, but it is also a grand strategy in building, in, in, in creating those monuments that we are happy to see even today. And then is the last part, the part when Pericles goes away and Alcibiades appears. This is, this is the strategy of uh, arrogance. Uh, this is the last part and uh, given this behavior, uh, uh, it has been led to uh, the end of the Athenian uh, empire. Now, so I want to make sure or make clear that in my view, uh, the leading power is, is Athens with a grand strategy, not just in the period of Pericles, but also in the period of uh, Themistocles, of Simon, and of even Alcibiades, even though his strategy, Alcibiades' clever and imaginative strategy, did not lead uh, did not lead to uh, to victory and to the maintenance of of the hegemony, but to its destruction. And let me turn to the last to the second uh, argument: why uh, why uh, Alison is wrong speaking about a trap. Now, to Athenaeus, Megalus Gignomenus, let's see, this is the structural part. The Athenians became superpower, became big, superior, and fovon parechondas tis lacedemonies, and making tis lacedemonies, and making fear to the Lacedemonians, Anangase estopolemin. They were compelled, they were obliged to go to war. Again, there's nowhere uh, the war was inevitable or made the war inevitable. This is a phrase taken from an old English translation made the war inevitable. So Thucydides never nowhere says uh, speaks of inevitability speaks of anangi anangase estopolemi now what made the athenians and the spartans anangase estopolemi was it the structural dimension to sathneus megalus gignomenus or the the first image the human nature fear, as, for example, Mersheimer could have argued. Now, 
My, my answer is none of the two. My answer is decision making, because after all, the war, uh, the two sides came to war after a decision was made. I remember first in Sparta, uh, the Athenians met and made their arguments. Then it was the Corinthians and the allies and Professor Novo has written about that, the, the conference uh, in, in Sparta, right? And then it was the Spartans alone who discussed. And there, there were two arguments, one by the king, Archidamus. Now, Thucydides gives to Archidamus five, six paragraphs and gives only one to Stenelaidas. Now, Archidamus makes the expected arguments about wisdom, about waiting, about preparing better, but, but Stenelaidas goes there and says, uh, the Athenians are, are, uh, are against us, uh, they create problems with, uh, to us, they harm our allies, they harm us. So the only choice we have is to go to war. And Stenelaidas does one more thing, the Ephorus. He asks a vote, but he also asks that the vote is taken in a specific way. Those in favor of war move in one side and those against the war move in the other side. And I'm asking, who, would, who could possibly be that Spartan who would vote publicly against, against the war? I'm afraid none. And that is how the decision to go to war was made. This is why I say that uh, the war was not inevitable. If some other speaker uh, could persuade them or give a gif different arguments, the result would have been different. And with this, uh, I conclude here my, my first presentation. Thank you for having the patience to, to listen to, to my presentation, my arguments. Elias, thank you very much. From what I understand, you are in complete agreement with uh, Professor Novo. And actually, since I know the argument of, uh, of the third speaker, all of you are in agreement that first of all, Alison oh, misinterpreted the text. He, he read the vital paragraph wrong. Oh, in other words, for any Greek, the word, the word anagi doesn't mean inevitability. Exactly. Uh, so, he, in other words, he was, Alison was lost in the translation. He got the wrong exactly. translation. And uh, as uh, Vasily and uh, I argue, or oh, if you go to the first, or the original translation of Thucydides in English done by Hobbes, the philosopher, he, he used the word necessity when he translates anagi and not inevitability. The second that all of you are in, ag in agreement is that he got history wrong. In other words, Athens, was by far the leading power uh, during the initial, when the war started. And Alison said the other way around, that Athens was rising yeah. and Sparta was the dominant power. I, I, I have to admit that this is a frequent mistake that the American academics are, are, are making uh, because of path-breaking work by Professor Kagan uh, the fourth volume on Thucydides uh, makes this argument. He, 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 he gets wrong the balance of power in the area. Uh, and uh, it, it's really funny 
who said it is spent his whole Pentecodetia, the 50 year period between the end of the Persian War and the initiation of the Peloponnesian War to explain the rise of Athens. And my American colleagues, instead of reading Thucydides and reading Pentecodetia, these 50 years, they read Kagan. Interpretation and there is more or less a consensus that somehow Athens was the rising power and Sparta is the leading power. Of course, uh, Professor Novo uh, is an exception to that because he reads the ancient uh, text and uh, uh, he gave the, the correct interpretation. But most of the international relations specialists uh, ac accept not the Thucydides interpretation. Uh, but, but Kagan's interpretation. Uh, so that's two very important points. Also, uh, I, I, if I understand correctly what you said in Leah, you put squarely the blame for the war on Sparta, which I love that. And it's the, the way that they decided. It, it was the manipulation of the decision-making by Stenelaidas. That's an interesting argument. I also blame Sparta for the war, but uh, not uh, for the decision uh, making process. No, what he, did, what he did was very clever. Yes. Uh, and and you, can, you can connect this uh, argument with the, the habits of the Athenians, the culture of the Athenians, uh, something that uh, Lebo and the constructivists do concerning the Uh, the, the, the culture and, and of, of the two cities. And it, wa it was the culture of the Spartans. Uh, when it comes to, to decision making, but the causes uh, may, 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 may be deeper. Now, let me turn to Vasily. Uh, and uh, Vasily, instead of uh, repeating the historical part, which I think the previous two scholars have covered it extensively. Uh, let, let me try to provoke you and try to bring you on the current. Uh, let me try to defend a, a little Alison here. Uh, Vasilis, let me try to use the concept of security dilemma. What you see that he said, after the end of the Persian Wars, There was always fear that the Persians will get involved in the Greek affairs again. So the Athenians had to take the lead to defend Greek, especially in the Aegean and Asia Minor, from Persia. And in order to do that, they became stronger. And by becoming stronger, this created a security dilemma for the other major Greek city, state, Sparta, And this led to a dynamic which caused the war. So there is, I mean, even if we try to deconstruct completely Alison or Thucydides, there is a structural argument there. I mean, there are changes in the balance of power. And I try to, to bring it uh, to the current affairs. Uh, you see there is the a right structural of, argument. Uh, yes, but we try. Uh, But let, let, let me try to, uh, to get the question. Uh, uh, so on the structural argument, let's try now to see how it applies to, to current US-Chinese relations before I turn the floor to Vasily. Uh, what I mean here, uh, the United States controls the oceans and by controlling the oceans create a huge vulnerability to China because it depends on trade, And it, reserves, uh, and it depends on resources, from energy and all kinds of resources for its industry. So China can, can be paralyzed immediately due to the dominance of, uh, that the Americans have in the seas. So the Chinese uh, try to reduce their dependence on the seas and create the Belt and Road Initiative, yes. trying to reach the world through Eurasia. And in doing that, they have a huge project, uh, the Belt and Road project that they invest trillions. Or, but this kind of uh, Belt and Road initiative, it looks now to the uh, uh, Americans that they try to occupy uh, Eurasia. 
And uh, as you know, oh, according to traditional geopolitical theories, the country that controls Eurasia controls the world. So is it here a kind of structural dilemma similar to Thucydides? I mean, China is trying to reduce its dependence on the sea and uh, it, it expanding its influence on, on, on Eurasia. The Americans see that Chinese are going to occupy Eurasia and then occupy the world. And does this lead to a kind of structural dynamic that it's similar to what Allison uh, more or less is expressing in his book that this makes kind of inadvertently these two oh, giants going one against the other. You will agree with that, Vasily? Well, I got the hardest question in tonight's show. Um, <laughs> you're making the parallelism with the extreme complexity of the ongoing China-US, China-US competition. But before going there, let me you know, thank you for the invitation. I'm very privileged to be here uh, with Andrea Novo, a young, yet although yet already established, well-established strategic intellectual in the US Academy. And of course, Professor Kuskovelis, uh, a veteran of strategic studies in Greece. Um, now, before addressing your question, let me just share some, some, some the, the history of how Thucydides, the authentic Thucydides made it to Beijing. And that was uh, March, I believe, or April 2019, when Thanasis Plotias came for a research visit at uh, Tsinghua University. And you have to remember that in those years, a couple of years before that, the geopolitical zeitgeist had drastically changed. The United States had issued two crucial reports, the U.S. National Security Strategy Report and the U.S. National Defense Report. And in both reports, China was featured as a clear and present danger for the United States. At the same time, if you looked in Congress, you would see an amazing degree of bipartisanship um, on China-related legislation so that Elizabeth Warren and Ted Cruz voted together. The only topic, the only issue was China. So the United States, it was clear in the past you know, year, two, year, two years and a half uh, before our event in Beijing in, 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 in March 2019, that it was shifting towards great power competition. All right, now China, China was also following a similar balancing behavior. It was fascinating that in, I believe, um, March 2017, the Chinese President Xi Jinping declared that there is a Chinese model uh, of development, uh, which means there is Chinese wisdom of how on how uh, other countries can accelerate their growth, whereas at the same time retain their national independence and sovereignty. And that is an inflection point for Chinese grand strategy because it abandons the hider strength and buy time strategy of Deng Xiaoping, and it makes China a much more proactive uh, uh, strategic player in the global arena. So again, this general backdrop of intensifying securitization and great power competition, Thanasis is in Beijing. And we reached out to a Chinese uh, friend. I saw this as a deus ex machina opportunity. So we reached out to our Chinese friends and we have this discussion about Thucydides and the Thucydides trap. Now, both uh, Professor Cuscovelis and Novo are exhaustive. So Thanasis, thank you for the nudge. I will, not repeat the, I will not repeat the historical arguments. I will just say something which is very important, that uh, decision-making, which Professor Cuscovelis matter, is front and center in Thucydides work. And here is a misaccuracy that you can see at Allison. So basically Allison argues that the Athenian decision to go to war was kind of based on the rational exuberance of the Athenian public. So the people, the Demos, led Pericles, that's in Allison's work, led Pericles to war. But it's exactly the other way around in Thucydides. You know, Pericles was the first citizen and Athens was a democracy only, only in name. So when the crucial 
discussion came about the revocation of the Megarian degree, Pericles made a clear argument for war, and he based that argument on his own theory of victory, which was a theory of victory based on a prolonged war of attrition, which the Spartans could not fight because they didn't have a navy. Right. And the, on the other hand, uh, the Spartans had their own theory of victory, which was a battle of annihilation. They wanted to march to Athens and fight a decisive battle. But obviously, we saw that that was, um, um, you know, that, 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 that was not a right strategy for the Spartans. They couldn't win the war. That and way. those concepts, that typology of strategy is very well uh, analyzed in Professor Platia's book, The Citizen Strategy. All right. Bringing that to the present, we have those Thucydidian, Thucydidian types of strategy, a battle of annihilation, Spartan perspective, and a prolonged protracted competition, attrition, the Athenian perspective. What can we learn about China and the US? Well, in our paper, Unraveling the Thucydides Trap, Inadvertent Escalation or War of Choice, we stress the necessity to study Thucydides ex antiquis and novissimis optima the best of the old, the best of the new. What does this mean? Obviously, we believe that perhaps 90% of the strategic first principles are in there, in the history of the Peloponnesian War. But there is perhaps a 10% of strategic first principles that they're not there. And the big elephant in the room is the invention of nuclear weapons. So obviously Thucydides couldn't talk about nuclear weapons because simply the technology was not there. And the, the existence of nuclear weapons means clearly that a strategy of annihilation, a strategy of decisive battle is out of the question. It's imperceivable that any country, either the United States or China, will fight and win, like we'll have a theory of victory which is based on fighting and winning a nuclear war. Now, somebody might say, but the US has an extended deterrence, counter, counter strike, first, um, uh, first strike and nuclear doctrine. Fine, we can debate about it, but we believe that Robert Jervis' argument on the impact of the nuclear revolution on great power politics has been conclusive and decisive as a result of that question. So basically, we have a simple strategy that both China and the United States are going to pursue in the years ahead. In JFK's words, a long, prolonged twilight struggle, twilight great power struggle. Now, what does this mean, actually? It means that uh, uh, strategic decisions may... There, it's not an automated strategy, right? It's a prolonged competition. So strategic decisions will be essential in shaping that strategy. And that brings us back to the argument that leadership matters, that Thucydides was not simply a structural theorist, but a complex theorist. He kind of uh, went back and forth in what modern IR theorists call levels of analysis. The structure is there, and it's very important, and Thucydides was the first historian to clearly highlight how structure shapes and narrows strategic decisions, shapes and shows, perhaps, uh, the uh, strategies of states. But then he talked a little bit about domestic politics, why, in his view, the Spartan political system was a bit more mature in making um, uh, uh, strategic decisions than the Athenian democratic system. And the most important aspect, he talked about prudential leadership. So he went to great lengths uh, to present us those called the Mihorias, the dialogues, the debates, if you wish, about strategy that took place in Athens, Sparta, and also Sicily. And in the Mihorias, you'll see that there was no predetermined outcome. The debate, as Professor Cuscovelli said, could have gone both ways in Sparta. Same thing in Athens. And that means that the capacity of a leader to persuade the citizens is consequential for shaping grand strategy. And so we believe that the most crucial argument that Thucydides made about strategy is that leadership must be prudential. 
the idea of sophrosyne, the idea and the ideal of sophrosyne, that if a leader is to protect and preserve the security of his or her state, he or her, he or she has to be prudential leader. And how do we define prudence, sophrosyne? First, a great leader has to understand the imperatives of the structure, the distribution of power. Second, he has to tame the worst propensities of his or her own nature, craving for wealth, glory, megalomania, and so on. And third, and most importantly, with foresight, pronia, guide the ship of state through the uncharted waters of international competition, which is endemic uh, in an anarchical system. And why do we stress prudence today for China and the US? Because you know, the very conception of the national interest in China and the US has to be a bit wider, not narrow. It has to be a bit wider. And it has to include issues like global warming, for instance, that um, if, if Washington and Beijing do not cooperate, we're all going to face the consequences in our generation or our children's generation. And it also has to conceive um, 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 issues like avoiding the next pandemic, creating a bio um, uh, a safety environment, which is transparent on a global scale, but this is not easy because both the US and China would have to sacrifice some part of their sovereignty to allow uh, scientists of the global community to intervene and build up this network of early warning, uh, early warning bio, biosecurity network. And so with that, I will just conclude addressing uh, Thanasis' question about the security dilemma the security dilemma has always been there, but I think the very existence of nuclear weapons makes both countries, both China and the US, double cautious. Because if you have a confrontation somewhere in the South China Sea or, is the, or, or in the East China Sea, now imagine, let's take a hypothetical scenario, that an anti-area access denial missile from the Chinese is sinking a US aircraft carrier and killing, I don't know, 2,000, 2,500 uh, US sailors. Well, do you think the US will just stand back? The US is going to escalate. So you're gonna have this escalation, perhaps inadvertently, but because of nuclear weapons, both sides do not wanna reach that level. So there will be double cautious. And I think history here can second that argument because if you see what happened in the Cold War, we talked about two superpowers, um, competing in a prolonged struggle for 50 years almost, uh, but there was not a single direct military conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States. So yes, the security dilemma is here, but it has been kind of alleviated substantially by the very existence of nuclear weapon. So that's my, my, my answer. Vasily, you scared me a lot. During the Cold War, we had no direct class between US and Soviets, now in the example that you gave, can you just conceive that the Chinese are sinking a US aircraft carrier and they uh, kill thousands of American sailors? This to my mind is Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor led to Eastern declaration of war and the liquidation of Japan. I mean, how can you feel so confident? No, that, no, uh, I said they will not do. So my argument was that a hypothetical scenario that that happens would perhaps lead to nuclear war. So they will not do so. That was my argument. I just wanted to stress the damage that will inflict upon the US and the necessity for the United States to retaliate. And so retaliation means escalation and escalation means very hard to control uh, the, 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 the orbit from conventional to nuclear. So it's not going to happen. That's my argument. So, the uh -huh. so, so you are confident that the US aircraft carriers, they will cruise in South China Sea next to Taiwan and nothing will happen. Excellent. <laughs> I hope I, I, I hope you, you, you prove right uh, in, in, in your prediction. Uh, Pro, Professor Novo, uh, you highlighted, uh, Andrew, uh, you highlighted the important of allies for Sparta, and especially Kerkira, uh, Corfu. Oh, and uh, I, I think you had 
an interesting point there. Uh, but Corfu could have changed the balance of power. I mean, uh, they had the second fleet or, or the third uh, fleet in Athens, and if the, uh, the, the Athenians, they were not taking advantage of it, and they have gone with Corinth, uh, this could have completely changed the, uh, the balance of power in Athens. And this uh, essentially uh, would have created a security dilemma for Athens. So Athens was trapped uh, in order to, to make this decision uh, and not let Corfu go. At the same time, you say that this created a huge instability in Sparta because it was so much based on its alliance system. And let me try to, to see if currently uh, we can make this, the, the same argument. Uh, as you said, Sparta was vulnerable to the defection of allies. Why it was vulnerable? Because it has no domestic room for internal balancing. As you pointed out, it was actually very fragile internally with the helots. He Therefore, you have a, a city state or a power with no capacity for internal balancing and uh, the possibility of losing its allies would have been the end of Sparta without war in a Sun Tzu type of scenario. So they, they had to react. Do you see a commonality now? I mean, uh, is this the US so vulnerable if it loses some allies? Uh, also, is the US without capacity for internal balancing? I think uh, when the US was stressed in World War II, uh, it, it went so deeply in internal balancing that it used 42% of its GDP for war purposes. So, uh, do you think that the analogy of vulnerabilities of Sparta and the US uh, are so relevant the way that Alison is presenting it? So I'm, I'm sure Vasilis is, is relieved now because someone else has gotten a challenging uh, question here. Uh, but I mean, it, okay, so I, I would say to that a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I think the, the Thucydides, the concept of the Thucydides trap and the issue for the United States today goes to the challenge that Thucydides presents to us about the types of power. And so obviously in today's world, power has some similarities with Thucydides world and it has some differences. So I, I think today's world is more characterized by bipolarity than, or will be more characterized by bipolarity, a US China you know, a US-China rivalry is more characterized by bipolarity than the Athenian Spartan war. I think that, that that's the trend, right? Where the United States and China will progressively distance themselves from Russia, which is, is having its own issues economically, demographically, and politically, the European Union, which doesn't seem to act as a power globally. Uh, India is always, you know, almost, it, it's always 10 years away from becoming a major power in international affairs. So. If the system becomes more bipolar with the United States and China, that means that they will, according to IR theory, and you're the IR theory expert, I'm just a historian, you correct me if I'm wrong, but according to IR theory in a bipolar system, the, the real poles care less about their allies because they are so pro properly powerful in and of themselves, and they have that capacity for internal balancing. I think what the Thucydides example shows us is supporting my argument that Athens and Sparta isn't really a bipolar system because individually they are not strong enough on their own. They need their allies. They need the power that the empires or the Peloponnesian League gives them in order to, to project power. And so it's the power of their allies that they're worried about losing. As you said, for Athens, it's a huge decision. And this sort of mirrors um, Kagan's argument about, you know, when the Corsairans come to Athens and say, help us, Corinth is coming to crush us. You have to help us. And Athens is like, why? Why would we do that? And they say, because if the Corinthians crush us, we are going to go over to their side. Their side means we go over to Sparta's side and that screws you. And the Athenians have this really difficult debate where they say, you know what? I mean, even Thucydides says it takes them two days to debate it rather than the usual one day. And then they come back with, okay, 
we're going to help you, but we're going to help you in a way that no one will notice that we help you by sending 10 ships to pretend to be there, but not actually be there, right? So I think that the, the parallel for today then forces us to examine what are the types of power and what would be a threat to American power. And I think that that's where your earlier point about BRI comes in quite well, because you mentioned, you know, winning without fighting. I mean, I think that's essentially what something like BRI is meant to do. How do we, how does China weaken the United States, its economic power, its diplomatic power, it, the, it, the relationships it has with allies without having to fight? Well, BRI is one way to do that. It's, it's a part of a way to do that, to erode America's economic influence, to erode its diplomatic influence, to erode its political connections, and then make it more isolated. And that's a very interesting point, Andrew. Now, if you reverse side and you, are, you see the issue from Washington, is it a winning strategy without fighting? Uh, let me, uh, you suggested that China is thinking about winning without fighting through uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, let me try to give you a tip. You suggested before uh, that one of the vulnerabilities of the Spartans were its helots. So, uh, 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 and the Athenians exploited that, right? Do you think that the US can exploit similar internal vulnerabilities in China? Of course, but exploiting vulnerabilities involves a kind of escalation. Right, which I don't know. I mean, which which will have to happen in a in a sort of sequential way. You know, the United States uh, exploited the Soviet vulnerability when the Soviets went into Afghanistan. Right, I don't think the United States is going to uh, just out of the blue start arming Uyghurs or fomenting rebellion in Western China. Right, it, it's not going to. It's not going to declare that it recognizes a separatist state in Tibet. It's not going to just declare that it supports independence for Hong Kong. Uh, because this would be an escalation. Uh, and, and this, I think, is one of the key lessons that we can really look at in Thucydides' account and try to apply it to the United States and China's relationship today is what are those key escalations and how policymakers try to walk this very delicate balance between saying, don't mess with me, I'm serious, but I don't want to go to war. And so, you know, you see that in the Athenian decision to send 10 ships to Corsaira and then to add another 20. You see that in the approach to the Megarian decree. You see that in the Spartan attempt to tell the Athenians, you know, retract the Megarian decree, stop the siege of Podidaia, give away part of your, your Delian League, your Athenian empire. There, there are these sort of graded steps because neither side wants to plunge immediately headlong into war. And I think, there are, to there are enormous vulnerabilities that China has, uh, but any steps that the United States takes to exploit those, I mean, we could, we could delist all Chinese uh, companies from the New York Stock Exchange. We could prevent Chinese companies from borrowing money in Washington and London. Uh, we could block export of, of, of foodstuffs to China, right? But these things involve an escalation. You use the example of Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor happened because the United States put an embargo on scrap metal and oil to Japan. And this pushed Japanese policymakers into a corner where they thought that their only realistic option was the use of military force. And I think if there's a Thucydides trap, that's the one policymakers have to be careful of if they want to avoid war, is don't push the other side into a situation where they're going to think that the only way that they can maintain their power and effectiveness is through armed conflict. Vasilis, do you buy this argument? I mean, look how the Americans behave during the Cold War against the Soviets, whereas so careful as Andrew just explained, I mean, they did try to do internal subversion, propaganda, all kinds of things in order to crumble the Soviet empire. Did they show this restraint uh, against the Soviet Union armed with 40,000 nuclear weapons that Andrew is just telling us that the Americans uh, will be so careful not due to China? Well, but, you know, but, 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 if I, if I may, and contribute something to 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 Vasilis because I, Vasilis said something very very uh, to the much the point. Well, Andrew said many others, but right now, uh, he he uh, the existence of nuclear weapons uh, that's very that's very important, 
And since we were speaking about inevitability, I must and contribute that to the discussion, not to the discussion then Vasilis may, may, may comment, is that in 1952-1953, uh, when there was a change of power, uh, Stalin left and then Malenkov took over for two years, one and a half year, etc. The discussion was whether war was in the, the, the conflict between the two blocks was inevitable or not. And it was then that uh, Khrushchev, uh, Khrushchev in 1953, if I'm not wrong, said that the, the war between the two blocks may be, uh, may be avoided. So there is a kind of, of a similar discussion and why the Soviets changed their position because of nuclear weapons. Now it is the same situation with nuclear weapons. And I think what the main argument that Vasilis made is similar to the one I made and similar to uh, what Andrew said about, about the, the choice. Now, there are not many choices left, only one choice. The strategy of attrition, which uh, which the Athenians had adopted. So I think, having said all these, I, I believe that Vasilis may 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 combine all these together and, and give us the the answer. Well, well, thank you. Let me just say that when it comes to protracted long twilight struggle, um, I think that intellectuals today, particularly in the US, tend to overestimate Chinese domestic vulnerabilities. Andrew was right. The US could cut financial capital from going to China, ostracize Chinese corporations from Wall Street and London Stock Exchange. But the internal market of China Try, uh, dwarfs the Soviet market market any time in the history of Cold War. It's already something like sixteen trillion dollars, and even if their growth falls below five percent or even four percent, it's going to you know double in fifteen years or so. Um, so they have an, an internal market which can be self-sufficient to a degree, and that's also very different from what Japan had uh, in, 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 you know, the, the days before uh, the Second World War. Now, at the same time, um, they have this relationship with Russia, and they're building this corridor to the Middle East through Pakistan and perhaps Iran. So, they also have ways to import energy resources. Uh, and when we go back to the Cold War, the real vulnerability of the Soviet Union was nationalism. So nationalism, the reason, was, the reason why nationalism was a vulnerability is because in the Soviet Union, something perhaps like 30% of the citizens, if not more, the Soviet citizen was not really Soviet. They were ethnic, ethnically identified. You know the the, the Uzbekistan's, the, Lat, the, the 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 Baltic countries, uh, and so on and so on, and and so those people, when nationalism infiltrated the Soviet Union, wanted to break away. Now in China, the minorities are around nine percent of the population, ten percent, but they're so widely dispersed throughout the territory, and they're basically just the Uyghurs and the Tibetans that they are more accumulated in the geographic region. So kind of a stretch of the imagination to see how a very Machiavellian strategy could just destabilize China from within. Uh, but, but Andrew made a very, very accurate point that if the US was to attempt that approach, that would be a clear signal of escalation and we don't want to see perhaps, you know, two giants like the US and China becoming extremely Machiavellian, because if they become extremely Machiavellian, other areas of cooperation that are important for the global commons, like uh, uh, climate change, and as I said, avoiding preventing the next pandemic will suffer as well. So it's gonna be catastrophic for basically everyone in this world. Um, and talking about nuclear weapons and, and, and Professor Cuscovelli's, so I think there's an interesting research going on right now about the expansion of the US uh, nuclear deterrent force, of the, um, uh, excuse me, the Chinese, Chinese. nuclear deterrence forces, the retaliatory, retaliatory forces. And we had the discussion with Anasis, and we think that the 
Chinese geography is a bit restrictive. So there's the first island chain and also the South China Sea. It's very difficult for China to have a survivable strategic nuclear force because it's very hard for them to penetrate the first island chain and you know make their submarines lost in the vastness of the oceans and as long they cannot have this um, strategic um, uh, nuclear force uh, submarine force the u.s might have nuclear superiority if the u.s has nuclear superiority that that might make the u.s a, a bit more risk prone to the South China Sea or to the East China Sea. So it's a big question here if China is going to respond by a extreme quantitative expansion of, their, of, of its nuclear arsenal. And this is a big debate right now in China. Um, so we'll see. It's a good, good period for strategic studies and research. Okay, I have one last question and that would be addressed to all of you. I mean, you are all fans of nuclear weapons and you say that they will bring peace automatically because they will make the superpowers careful. But in my mind, strategic competition is endemic and it's going to be here. So they have to be careful, but at the same time, they will compete. How they will compete? I mean, they will compete economically. Uh, they will compete technologically, they will compete in propaganda, ideologically, uh, on uh, destroying reputation of what uh, another. Uh, they will uh, try to walk through subversion with denial, there will be uh, cyber warfare. I cannot, uh, as a realist, I cannot foresee that the competition will stop because of nuclear weapons. So maybe a traditional war is not in the cards, but all kinds of other instruments are in the cards. So how this will play, and, and again, uh, how they will, these great powers, they will keep the balance that this will not escalate. I mean, the, the inadverted escalation argument is not completely dead. That's why, what I'm trying to say, given the fact that competition will be taking place elsewhere. And, and I highlighted three or four or five areas that competition will take place. So, uh, uh, Ilya, let me start uh, with you and then I will go to Vasily and I will give the last word to, to Adriu. Uh, well, my, thank you, Sanas. My, my easy answer is that all the above, uh, all <laughs> that you mentioned, uh, they are in play. Uh, I must say, though, that uh, we, we should see uh, the, 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 the nuclear power differential. That means that uh, the United States still maintains uh, these level of powers, of these level of nuclear weapons that allow the United States to adopt different types of strategies. And, uh, perhaps it is the case of the possibility of having um, counter force strategies against strategic forces of, of China and then have a possibility of a second or a third strike. Uh, but uh, given the, 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 the capacity of destruction that nuclear weapons entail, is more probable that we have the various types of competition as you those that you that you mentioned uh, uh, in, in, and including including um, uh, hi, hybrid uh, hybrid war strategies and propaganda uh, which uh, already the Chinese are using, especially uh, in combination with their uh, commercial uh, promotion strategies. So we, we may see all of them. Now, uh, the, the question is, who is going to, to endure this kind of attrition that the one and the other side uh, is going to or they are already apl applying to each other. 
who is going to endure such a war, such competition of, of attrition? That's, that's the main, uh, the key question, I would say. Uh, Ilya, this is a brilliant point. I mean, there are two systems are competing, uh, like the Cold War, and uh, one proved more resilient than the other. The other pro proved very fragile, and uh, it was self-destroyed without saving uh, a, a war. So the, precisely what you said is one possible scenario or, uh, about the future, which is really a, a marathon competition, a competition that may take 100 years. Yeah. Uh, over over time, it's it's a competition over time now. Given uh, the uh, presence of nuclear weapons and those restrictions that nuclear weapons may may entail. So the key strategic concept here is resilience. Yes, Vasily, what's your take? Yeah. Okay. Let me say. I think Thucydides was, would respond to that question that Professor Cuscovelli yeah. posed by saying the most prudential leader, the most prudent leader, the most sovereign leader would win the competition. All right. But let me make it a bit more specified here. I think you're you're both right. Competition is going to be comprehensive. It's going to be economic. It's going to be technological. It's going to be ideological. Uh, it's going to be uh, perhaps in the gray zone and so on and so on. But from all those areas, I would focus on technology simply because technology forms the under structure for the economy. And if you have a solid material foundation, you can spend both in welfare and therefore solidify your domestic societal strength. And in warfare, that means building assets to, you know, have a theory of victory and making your military stre uh, uh, strength much higher. Having said that, I believe that technology in today's world is more software than hardware. And software, obviously, it's big data and AI. So in all strategic fora right now, in China and the US, AI, the impact of artificial intelligence in the material foundation, on the material foundation of the nations is fundamental. And what we know, that's a very nascent technology. It's a very nascent technology. We don't quite know how it will evolve, if it will evolve, and if it's going to be a disruption 10 years from now, 20 years from now, five years from now. But what we do know is that AI technology is based on three things, computational power, um, uh, uh, the, the, the human talent, the engineers, the software engineers you have, and quantity of data. And so if you take those through the three factors and you think of the US and China, the US right now has a computational advantage, but China is very close. Uh, although, you know, because of the microchips capabilities and because of Taiwan and all the allies coming close to the U.S., that advantage is going to remain for the next five to 10 years. The U.S. has a bit of a talent advantage because it can attract not just American computer engineers, but global talent. Seven billion people. The U.S. has this amazing H-1B visa, which is a secret weapon. So they attract the best and smart, smartest engineers, including Chinese. But China has an advantage on the third variable, which is quantity of data. And because they have this enormous netizen population, closed and separated, segmented by the Great Firewall, that data advantage is important. So it's, it's very interesting to see how this technology competition is going to evolve, to evolve down the road. But, you know, let me just conclude by stressing my original point, the Thucydidean argument that Sofrosini and prudential leader, leadership will be consequential for winning that competition, for a theory of victory. Vasily, you set yourself for a really hard question. I mean, which of the two competing great powers has an advantage of Sofrosini? Uh, and I come to Thucydides in explaining the outcome of the Peloponnesian War. It said one domestic system, the Spartan, the authoritarian, provided an, an advantage to Sparta in the competition compared to the democratic Athenian uh, system that it fluctuated. It fluctuated from Trump to Biden, from Alcibiades to Nikias. And um, uh, in other words, do you think that uh, given the different domestic system that one domestic system can produce more sofrosini than the other. 
Yeah, again, I think I'll talk more about leadership because think of the Chinese system. Institutionally, the Chinese system did not change between Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping. It was the leader that changed. So the institutions were actually the same, but it was Deng Xiaoping that kind of paved a new strategic direction for China and turned China from an impoverished agricultural society to a technological industrial behemoth. And at the same time, look at the United States. Like the United States are performing very differently under Trump and under Joe Biden. So, well, institutions are important, but I find it very difficult in a political science perspective um, to kind of theorize and model the strategic prudence that simply the institutional dimension, the polity factor, can predict. There is this strong democratic theory. Um, I think there's a professor at Georgetown, um, uh, Matthew Cronin, who wrote a book, Autocracy versus Democracy, and so on and so on. But I think there's so much complexity on the polity factor. This may, makes it very hard to theorize. So I'll stick with my original argument that leadership is the most consequential variable on sound prudential strategy. Okay, Andrew, you well, have the last word. Who, 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 which okay. system produced the most prudential, prudential leaders? Yours well, or the Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this is this is uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, on your last on your last point, I mean, Thucydides, as you said, he blames he blames the infighting and the instability of the Athenian system uh, for the defeat of Athens. I mean, he says that that this is what really brought Athens down was the and I mean, he, he lived through a time where there were several coups, uh, several changes in political system, not just in government, you know, that you get one party or the other, one faction or the other, but actually changes in the, in the Athenian government. Um, so that, that is a kind of vulnerability. I mean, I think the more rigid the system, as indeed the Chinese system is quite rigid, um, the more rigid the system, the more brittle it becomes. And so it doesn't bend, it either, it either stays or it breaks. Uh, and and the, the American system bends and changes, and sometimes it changes to the right, and sometimes it changes to the left, and sometimes it changes to the uh, isolationist, and sometimes it changes to the engagement, but, it, but it, the capacity to bend is, a, is an advantage um, as opposed to the brittleness that, that might break. Um, just a couple of other points that, that came up that, that didn't get uh, made since a lot of good ones were made. Um, one that was made is this competition across all domains, of course, is going to happen. It's even in the sort of, it, it's in the bingo that we play in the Pentagon. Any, any Pentagon meeting is going to talk, you put in your bingo card, if you put the term all instruments of national power, you're guaranteed to check that, right? So the idea that there are all instruments of national power, economic, political, social, as you said, propaganda technology, that's going to be part of this competition. I think what's going to define whether it becomes violent or not. And that's really the question that, you know, we, we, in criticizing the concept of a Thucydides trap, I think one of the things we forget is that it, it's telling us something useful, but it's not going far enough. The useful thing it's telling us is, yes, there are reasons to be concerned when you have changes in the distribution of power in a system, because that's going to make states worried about their security, and this is going to lead to hostility and competition and potentially war. Where the formulation of Allison's Thucydides trap is less useful is he doesn't go the next step and tell us, well, what, so what exactly is it that we are afraid of? What is the United States afraid of from China? Is it afraid of China becoming rich? Is it afraid of China building aircraft carriers? Is it afraid of China pulling away US allies? Like, you know, the Philippines is gonna repudiate their alliance with the United States, their 70 year alliance with the United States and become an ally of China. We don't know. And that's what we need to explore. And that's where Thucydides can be helpful to try to get us to think about what are those things that we would be afraid of? Uh, because as I said, changes in the balance of power do make states feel weaker or more vulnerable and that can lead to problems. I think the other question that we, we didn't talk about, which is an important one is to think of, well, what are the concessions that the two sides, the United States and China are willing to make in order to avoid going down a more conflictual relationship? And the United States and the Soviet Union, when they clashed, clashed because they were not on the same page about their concessions, right? The Soviet Union said, oh yeah, sure, we can put missiles in Cuba. And the United States said, no, that's not, that's not something we can accept, right? You want to you wanna put down a revolution in Hungary? Fine. You want to put down a revolution in Czechoslovakia? Fine. We're not going to do anything. 
you want to put missiles in Cuba, we have a problem. And I think that what the United States and China are going to struggle with going forward is kind of defining those parameters of the relationship, right? What are the things that you can do that we're going to be unhappy about, but we can't do much about? And what are those things that if you do, we're going to retaliate in some way and you're not going to like the retaliation? And that then creates a dangerous, going back to your original point about, that creates a very dangerous escalation dynamic, which, 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 would, which would be my primary worry. Well, it took Yalta to divide areas and uh, make the rules uh, of the road and coexist uh, at the same time competing. Uh, so let's, uh, uh, which was good for the great powers, but not necessarily for the smaller states that they found themselves in uh, the zones of uh, influence of one uh, great power or, or, or another. Greece, of course, was the lucky one because uh, it was in the right side of history, but uh, a lot of other countries in Central and Eastern Europe were not so lucky. Uh, anyhow, that was a fascinating uh, discussion uh, that uh, really spun in 25 centuries. We started of what was happening by the end of uh, uh, the Persian Wars and <laughs> we come on the 21st century of what may happen between uh, the, the, the US and China. Uh, I, I think uh, all of you, you highlighted different important theoretical and policy oriented aspects. And I'm really grateful for uh, really facilitating uh, su such a great discussion. I hope Andrew will see you in Piraeus, not only in, uh, when you come to Athens, you should go only to Thessaloniki. Uh, and uh, we should uh, philosophize uh, next to the great port that produced the first maritime empire, which and is next to the university. Uh, so, thank you uh, to all of you, and uh, we will continue it, our discussion. Thank you very it, much, Ilya. And it was a prudent, a prudent discussion to refer to Vasilis, <laughs> and uh, a discussion which did not abuse because Andrew mentioned the use and abuse of Thucydides by Bagby, and that is a very important way to approach Thucydides without abusing. We did not abuse of him, and we, we were very careful. And Thanasi, you, thank you for, for leading the discussion. And could I, could I just say that I hope next time we'd have the Chinese scholars with us and make it like the debate a little bit more fervent. Well, let's hope. You, you see, you have to blame for that. Last moment, I changed the title from Thucydides' no. stra strategy and grand power to Thucydides' trap. So when the Chinese saw the world trap, they say, ha ha, they are setting a trap here. <laughs> okay, well, we hope we will have the Chinese scholars with us next time because the, the two ones that we invited and enthusiastically accepted were the really leading scholars on Thucydides, and uh, it could have been uh, a, a huge addition to our debate if we had their views. So, once again, thank you very much. Thank Take you, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.